Skylake is upon us. What do you need to know? <laughs> You're gonna have to wait for the bump. Technically, Skylake is a successor to Broadwell, which came after Haswell, but since I'm pretty sure most of you guys are probably rocking Broadwell, Ivy Bridge, Sandy Bridge, Maybe something older. Maybe you're rocking a Q6600. Because Intel still can't seem to count past four cores on everything except, you know, the X99 Super Socket 2011 platform. So Skylake is out. What do you need to know? What all's different? Well, it's a different socket. So we've issued Socket 1150, and now we're on Socket 1151. Um, the big change that comes with that is that they've gotten rid of the fully integrated voltage regulator, or the Fiver. So I've got a thing to show you. This is a an Itanium 2. And Itanium, this is a really old processor. If it wasn't for AMD, you guys would all be rocking a processor like this for your 64-bit platform. Uh, AMD basically invented the 64-bit extensions that are in modern Intel processors that are backward compatible with the 32-bit architecture. Uh, Intel was working on this, and so this is the Itanium 2. This is the Itanium 2's fully integrated voltage regulator. Not really, it's not really fully integrated. See, it's, it's, this is just, you know, the connector. And so with Haswell, they said, let's put all the voltage regulation circuitry on the chip. That can't possibly end badly. And then it made a lot of heat. It actually makes a lot of sense from an OEM standpoint from, you know, computer manufacturers, companies like Dell, HP, Microsoft that are making the Surface tablet. Having the integrated voltage regulator, yeah, it does add a little bit of heat, but it helps with a lot of other things in terms of manufacturing and production, having all that crap crammed on the IC, I mean, you can really see how far we've come. The Itanium 2, this is from, I think, 2002. So this is not an insanely old, okay, yeah, it is insanely old. It's absolutely ancient in, in computer terms. But, you know, that part was the voltage regulator. This part was the actual processor. And so the, the power delivery circuitry is that huge, you know, this, this copper connector on here, it seems like there's a lot of pins, but it's really not. It's really just two huge copper connectors because this thing had all the amps. So with Haswell, they have they put that all that on there with Skylake they took it all off again so we're talking about multiple power delivery circuits that are actually on the motherboard now that's actually good for overclockers because overclockers can deliver different sets of power to different parts of the chip to help them with overclocking and we've got some early reports of people that are using liquid nitrogen hitting 6.5 gigahertz but what you really want to know is how overclockable is it going to be for you? Well, we don't know yet because it just came out. I mean, this is August 5th, hopefully. We didn't accidentally release it early, but this is August 5th. Skylake hopefully has been announced at Gamescom. If not, well, we're just going to sit on this video and it'll be sometime after August 5th because we don't actually know. Nobody ever loops us in. It's fine. It's whatever. So, Skylake. Woo. It's out. It doesn't have an integrated voltage regulator, and some people have claimed to hit 6.5 gigahertz on it. Well, our sources tell us that the pre-production Skylake CPUs, that's the i7-6700K. It's 4-core, 8-thread, 8 megs of L2 cache. Sounding pretty familiar. It's got massively upgraded Iris Pro graphics and DirectX 12 support. But other than that, in terms of, you know, core performance, like raw single-thread performance, raw multi-core performance, it's basically on par with Haswell and Sandy Bridge and Ivy Bridge that came before it, clock for clock. It is a little bit faster. You get a little a little bit of a bump, but it's not, you know, gains of 20, 30%. Now, it does have more extra instructions that will speed up certain tasks by a significant percentage. So, for example, it has integrated uh, support for the codec, the VP8, VP9, and HVEC codecs for encoding and decoding. And so those tasks will be significantly improved. The platform itself has PCI Express 3.0 support through and through. On Z97, it was kind of a split deal. You had PCI Express 3.0 coming out of the CPU, and then you had a, a DMI 2.0 interface that was an interface to the Z97 chipset. Well, Skylake sort of gets rid of that and replaces it with PCI Express 3.0 across the board. So you effectively you've got four more PCI 3, PCIe 3.0 uh, lanes than you did with Haswell. Now that doesn't mean that you're going to be running three graphics cards effectively, but the extra PCI Express lanes will help with USB connectivity, with SATA Express and SATA connectivity. That's going to help with a lot of the other peripheral connectivity that you have inside the chip. Now in terms of layout, there's still 16 PCI Express lanes that are connected directly to the CPU. The other X PCI Express lanes will actually go through the Z170 chipset, but the Z170 chipset has a lot better connectivity with the DMI 3.0 interface on this particular CPU, which is probably what's going to lay the foundation for whatever comes next in PCI Express for the enthusiast version of this that hopefully will be on some form of Socket 2011. That said, 
because of the fiber changes and because of the way that the uh, motherboard layout is now with the MI 3.0, you got to have a new motherboard. It's a new socket, new chipset. There you go. Uh, there's still no support for USB 3.1 that's integrated. However, you know, the, uh, the number of USB three ports that are provided by the, the chipset is up from six to 10, up to 10. It's up to the motherboard manufacturer to import that however they want. Although it seems like a lot of motherboard manufacturers are sort of laughing in the face of Intel's antiquated USB 3.0 support and putting on their own as media USB 3.1 chipset. Um, and that's kind of nice because the bump from USB 3.0 to 3.1 is that you get, you know, the 10 gigabit USB interface. Me, personally, I think that all this copper stuff needs to go. We need to go ahead and go to USB 3.1 Type-C for everything and uh, optical for everything else because the USB connect connection is just too bulky and we need 10 gigabits for everything. Also, SATA Express. We've got some interesting SATA Express peripherals uh, that are coming out that sort of bridge the gap between SATA Express and USB 3.1. So depending on your motherboard layout and the, the types of options that have been chosen by your motherboard manufacturer, you're going to see multiple M.2 slots, maybe SATA Express connectivity that can be used for other things like USB 3.1. Uh, maybe you're going to see, you know, multiple SATA ports, or maybe you're going to see other PCI Express connectivity on the motherboard for the peripherals. So it really gives motherboard manufacturers a lot of flexibility in picking and choosing what they want to do with their hardware platform. And that's really nice because on Haswell, it was kind of limited. It's like, well, you know, if we don't go with the integrated Intel NIC, we're going to have to use some of the PCI Express lanes for an add-in NIC. So if you guys out there that are fans of the killer NIC or something other than an Intel NIC that doesn't actually use the, the resources built into the chipset itself, then it would consume PCI Express lanes. So there you go. Oh, the other thing that I forgot about this chipset was that it supports DDR4. Um, DDR4, now right now they're advertising capacities up to 64 gigabytes, but if I'm reading the spec sheet correctly, it would actually support eight ranks of 16 gigabytes chips, which would be a total of 128 gigabytes of RAM support. Now, theoretically on DDR3, we were supposed to get 64 gigabytes of support on DDR3. That didn't pan out for a variety of reasons, except on a few very limited platforms like the Intel Aviton. But on this platform right now today, DDR4, 64 gigabytes of support. But it's not actually the case that it is exclusively DDR4. There's actually a bunch of different SKUs or a bunch of different versions that are going to be put out. So right now, everything that I've been talking about, I've been talking about the desktop chipset Z170 and the Skylake desktop processor. But Intel's bread and butter really doesn't come from enthusiasts like us. It really comes from tablet sales, laptop sales, that kind of thing. And so Intel has really sort of worked on tailor making some other versions of Skylake that include different features for different market segments. And so one of the things that they've kept in Skylake is support for DDR3. Now you're probably not going to see that on desktop versions of the chip, although you might, maybe, I don't really know. I'm not speaking from any sort of insider knowledge or, or anything like that, but DDR3 support on the mobile uh, versions of the chipset, they're going to keep because it means low power. And so when they're rolling out ultra low wattage versions of Skylake, like the dual core, low clock rate, uh, they're gonna add uh, level four cache, probably 128 megs of eDRAM. And that is gonna help them lower the power usage of Skylake for things like the Surface Pro tablet from Microsoft and other sort of tablet laptop convertibles. Those, are, those devices are really thin, really light, there's not physically a lot of room for battery, so low power consumption is the name of the game there. there in, in terms of DDR3 versus DDR4, DDR4 gains, like the gains that you would get from implementing DDR4 in those types of use cases, really not much. Basically speaking, DDR3 is more inexpensive than DDR4, even though we're going to see DDR4 in higher capacities. And so the trade-off on mobile devices is really that you're going to have portable devices that needs DDR3 support just to lower power utilization and lower cost. So we're still going to see Skylake devices that have DDR3 support. I mean, heck, we've got, you know, Atom based phones that have DDR3. So DDR3 is going to be around for a while longer. And that's good for us because it just means that overall prices are going to be lower. Now, is it going to be like the Core 2 Quad days where you had some motherboards that were DDR3 support and some motherboards that were DDR2 support and it just depended? Yeah, possibly. I mean, it's not out of the realm of possibility that some motherboard manufacturer would make a DDR3 supporting desktop version of the Skylake motherboard. I haven't seen one, but that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Now, in terms of thermal power design or how much heat is this thing going to generate, 
the Skylake processors are designed, the desktop versions, uh, with a top end of 95 watts. Now it's available in other configurations. OEMs, just like their mobile counterparts in Broadwell, are able to pick sort of a power distribution point. So like if Dell or HP or somebody wants to make an ultra low power desktop, they totally could use a 6700 processor, probably not a 6700K, because K means overclock, but they totally could use a 6700 i7, but they can configure the i7 package on their end to not be 95 watts, which it is out of the box, but 65 watts or 35 watts are two of the other uh, power platforms or like thermal design power targets that Intel is shooting for. So those thermal design power targets mean that you can see these processors in in things like Nux or, or ASRock's B-Box or other devices like that that are maybe fanless or have a very, you know, sort of low power fan and they can't really dissipate 95 watts worth of heat. Now for us in terms of overclocking, the low power it is, the better. So this is kind of unusual because 95 watts for the desktop part is actually a little bit higher than we were seeing with Haswell. And so normally when, with a die shrink, so we've gone from 22 nanometers in Haswell to 14 nanometers with Skylake. And so usually there's a power reduction. But in this case, we're at 95 watts thermal design power. And with overclocking, you know, we're really in more in the 150 watt thermal design power neighborhood. But that's okay because, you know, like I say, our sources tell us that about 50% of the CPUs are going to be overclockable to about... 4.6, 4.7 gigahertz, but only a very small number of CPUs will actually hit 4.8 gigahertz and be stable. Now, of course, you'll need good cooling for that. You'll probably want, you know, all-in-one water cooling or triple radiator water cooling if you're going to push past 4.7, something like that. But we haven't done a full overclocking thing, so take all the overclocking stuff with a grain of salt. This is day one. The only thing that existed prior to day one are non-retail versions of the CPU. So we have to buy a bunch and actually see what's going to happen and see if we can get sort of a cherry overclocker. Now remember that we hit 4.8 on one of our Haswell chips and we were, you know, that was like the luckiest thing ever. I don't think we're going to be that lucky again, but with the, the engineering pieces that we've played with, 4.6 seems reasonable. 4.6 I would say is about a 50% on a, based on our limited sample size, the rumors that we've been hearing of about a 50% uh, success rate overclocking to 4.6 is pretty good. Now out of the box is 4.0 and the turbo speed out of the box is 4.2. It's also a little different uh, from predecessors. The turbo speed 4.2 is on all four cores as opposed to the games that have been played in the past where you can hit 4.2 on two cores but 4.0 on the other two cores and things like that. This is 4.2 across the board from what we can tell, probably. 95% sure of that. So we'll see what happens. It is worth considering the platform if you have a lot of PCI Express peripherals or you're looking at moving up from whatever you've got now to PCI Express based storage. I mean, the Intel 750 PCIe SSDs are the sort of the current king of the hill in that they can move two gigabytes per second, plus or minus. Uh, of course that requires a PCI Express interface or um, some sort of PCI Express over mini SAS or ever how that shakes out. Basically, SATA ain't fast enough, so you need a direct PCI Express interface for your SSD. And if you're going to upgrade to a platform with those features, or you're going to get a new graphics card that has PCI Express 3.0, the platform's probably worth a look. The fact that everything on this platform is PCI Express 3.0 interface is going to be a really big help in terms of peripheral connectivity. So USB 3.1C, that kind of thing. I really think the real innovations for this platform are going to be in small form factor PCs and portable PCs or, you know, portable computing devices, I should say. So tablets, laptops, convertibles things like that, the extra connectivity and the extra interfaces here, I think are really going to help those platforms more than the desktop platform. Now, of course, on the desktop platform, you know, if you're already on X99, this is not an upgrade for you. You're going to have to wait for the extreme version of the CPU. Although the rumor is that the extreme version of the CPU may actually add PCI Express 4.0 and other features like that. We don't know. That's, that's way, way on down the road. This is really more of the low cost, but performant platform. And of course you're still limited to four cores. Me personally, I would have liked to have seen a six core part on this platform. Eight cores is maybe pushing it, but with DDR4 and some of the extra connectivity on this platform, I would have really liked to have seen a six core part. I'm a little bit surprised that, that there hasn't been. Now, one other thing I'm excited about but that you guys probably won't care about, but I kind of like is the extra PCI Express connectivity for Xeon. So the lower end Xeon, the Xeon E3, Xeons are like the Intel core series. You've got the E3, the E5, and the E7, 
in the Xeon family, and that's just like the Core i3, the Core i5, and the Core i7. Now, the, the Xeon E3, historically, has actually been a really good value. They've been, especially when Intel first sort of came out with the E3, they didn't really know how to price them, and so they were way underpriced for what you got. They've sort of fixed that, so they're, it's not as good a deal as it used to be. But the new Xeon platform with the extra PCI Express connectivity, because typically on the Xeon you're going to have more add-in cards. You might have a 10 gigabit Ethernet adapter. You might have fiber channel. You might have other peripherals like that. 16 PCI Express 3.0 lanes on the previous generation Xeons. It was kind of terrible. I didn't. It was it was almost good, but not quite enough. So if you wanted to, you know, get a Xeon and run something like a Quadro plus something else, it was a little annoying. But with this, having the extra connectivity and being able to properly support RAID uh, at the PCH level with your PCI Express interface SSDs, that's a big help. Although you probably should still be running a PCI Express RAID controller or ZFS on another box and then a 10 gig ethernet connection or some permutation of that. It's also really surprising that this platform does not have 10 gigabit ethernet support because the corresponding platform updates um, for Abiton, the Xeon D, and some of the other stuff from Intel, those are incorporating 10 gigabit ethernet in the PCH now. So I gather that the rest of the stuff to support 10 gigabit ethernet, I'm surprised that there's not at least a variant of it, maybe not default support for it, but some kind of support for it in the Z170 PCH. But haven't seen anything like that either. Well, in terms of launch day coverage, what do we got? Well, we've got a couple of motherboards to take a look at, and we've got an overclocking guide. I'm not sure if we're gonna have all that done in time for launch day, but stay tuned. Be sure to subscribe to all of our channels below and you know, make an account on the website and subscribe to the Twitter, all that stuff, so that you can keep up with everything. That's been a quick overview of Skylake. If I've left out any details, be sure to put them in the comments. Maybe somebody will read the comments and, and upvote it or whatever. I'm, I'm done droning on for ever how long this has been. I'm really sorry. Thank you for making it all the way through the video, and I'll see you on the forums. I'm Wendell, and I'm signing out.